Welcome to Adapting to Global Threats Fireside Chat. You mean my voice isn't loud enough for all of you? Do you want to do the dance again? Okay, so Irene Maradas, I lead Analyst Relations. Thrilled that you're here. Thrilled about this next fascinating discussion. So with that, Taz Khan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Please take it off from here. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Good? Awesome. Um, there's a lot to discuss today, and I'm going to start off and set the stage, and then we're going to go ahead and dive in. But today's global threat landscape has truly shifted in unprecedented ways. The increased connectivity of people and devices for both personal and corporate use has created ever-expanding attack services that extend throughout the world. And it's putting some of our most critical infrastructure at risk. And as these malicious actors become more sophisticated, including nation states and criminal syndicates, cyberspace has become the most volatile frontier for both businesses um, within the public and private sector. So this session today is going to give us a first-hand look of some of our own people from Cisco and a lot of their on-the-ground work talking about how these malicious cyber activities coming out of the war in Ukraine has impacted us globally um, and impacted a lot of our defense tactics. So our speakers today are going to share some hopefully never be heard before heard stories of what real-time defense has looked like and how organizations in every industry should prioritize the growing number of threats. So without further ado, I would like to introduce all the way from the left, um, Dave Lewis, who has had 30 years of intensive industry experience within the IT security operations and management space. Dave is also a global advisory CISO for Cisco. And then in the middle, we have JJ Cummings, who has worked actively in the security and intelligence community for more than two decades. JJ leads a group within Cisco, Talos Threat Intelligence, and our interdiction team, tasked with nation state, critical infrastructure, law enforcement, and intelligence-based concerns. That's a lot. I'm excited to see what that means today. Um, Nick Biasini has been working in the information security space for nearly two decades as well, and in his current role, um, as head of outreach for Cisco Talos, researchers tasked with finding cutting edge of the threat landscape. So, um, we're gonna have a stream of consciousness. This is gonna be a conversation and not an awkward panel, okay? We promise you that. And so I'm gonna start off with asking a question to set the stage for everybody, right? So, um, Nick, I will ask you, mm -hmm. why is the invasion of Ukraine such a notable milestone for global security? Well, it's, it's a unique experience for a lot of us. You know, we don't often, thankfully, don't often work in wartime. So for us to be able to have the visibility and be able to do what we can to support Ukrainians has been um, very, very important for us and, and a great experience across the board. Um, as far as things that we've learned, um, it, it has really opened our eyes. Uh, one of the biggest things that we've learned is you know, when you're in region, when you are a single customer, you are able to be a lot more aggressive. Uh, that, that's probably one of the biggest things that I've taken away out of this. You know, as a, as a threat intelligence organization, we always have to err on the side of caution, right? You only can block the things that do bad things. But if you are an organization, be aggressive. Block more than we can block. If you have a bad activity from a single IP, don't just block the IP, block the entire network. You have utilities that you don't use on your network, block them. You don't need them to be there. These are the types of things that we constantly see adversaries doing, and it really, really makes a difference if you go above and beyond. We can't be that aggressive, but you absolutely can, so please do so. 
I love that. Um, and, and so in addition to that, I think there's been some historical, um, I guess, partnership with Ukraine or work that we've done. So JJ, do you mind sharing some of our history like in Ukraine and with Ukraine? Absolutely, Taz. Um, we have been working in Ukraine directly with a variety of organizations, establishing relationships and, and trust for uh, a little over six years at this point. Uh, we went into Ukraine with a very specific intent of, uh, well, really a couple of intents. Uh, certainly, we wanted to help them uh, against a very specific adversary that we also were keenly interested in, um, which, of course, I wouldn't have said this six years ago, but I'll openly say now that that was Russia. Um, Ukraine has been the target uh, of Russian aggression for a long time, kinetically and electronically. Mm. That's no big secret. Definitely, uh, in recent times, it's, it's no secret. Uh, dating back to a number of different events that we've, we've helped them through, we've been able to um, really to, to hone our understanding of how the specific adversary in question uh, was going to act, what type of actions they might take, how they might take those actions, when they might be prompted to take those types of actions. Uh, so it's, it's been a very focused uh, and long-lasting effort that we've uh, engaged in, and we've developed amazing relationships with um, a lot of entities, unfortunately, that I'll never name, uh, but we've, we've had a lot, of, uh, a lot of great successes in region, and, and I think it's been, a, it's been a, a good, a wonderful learning exercise, frankly. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure, unfortunately, I don't think that this will be the last of these kinds of efforts that we might need to implement, so I'm glad that we are um, learning by the fire, I guess, right? But um, now, I know the two of you are strategic and tactical, and we're going to dive into more of the tactical, but Dave, um, I had a question for you. Go. So are these roles and activities similar to what you would see like at an enterprise scale? Uh, yeah, a lot of enterprises that I've worked in over the years, like I spent 20 years as a defender before ever crossing over into the vendor space. So I saw this sort of thing on a much smaller scale in many of the enterprises that I worked at, but one of the problems that we had in these enterprises is we didn't have the bench strength that we needed in order to cover all of the threats. And this is where we had to go out to external organizations like Talos to get you know, that extra help in order to take care of things. Because the internet's a live fire environment at the best of times, and when you add in the kinetic element, like we're seeing in Ukraine, um, the stakes are absolutely you know, getting lifted up. So organizations that needed help before really need it now because we're seeing a spillover effect from the war in affecting all industry verticals. I wanna expand on that a little bit. So do you see organizations also um, taking things a little bit more seriously? Do you see the sentiment changing across the board, whether it's on the board or C-level executives that you're working with? By and large, the vast majority of them, yes. Uh, yeah. There is always the outlier that has a different opinion. Over the last couple of years, I've been very fortunate to be able to do CISO roundtables, basically one a week. And it's really interesting to see how, across all the industry verticals, there are shared pain points. And it doesn't really matter if you know, you're making teddy bears or medical equipment, you're really sharing you know, that same sort of pain point, that stressor, and being able to share information with each other in those groups is really helpful. And their vast majority of them are definitely taking this far more seriously than they may have done in the past. Yeah, and any of you, right? Um, I think a large part of this, there's a lot of work that we're doing as individuals and service providers and whatnot, but can you describe how you might use some technology to approach um, the more complicated detection problems that you're seeing? And it, any of you can answer. That's a, that's a challenging question, right? Um, we always want to be able to use technology to identify rapidly, to react rapidly, to contain rapidly, um, and, and ultimately to evict the adversary from your environment. Um, so certainly we're using, and we're deploying freely in region, a, a, a wide array of technologies, um, from duo multi-factor, to Cisco Secure Endpoint, to Umbrella, uh, and you know they all serve a very unique role. Um, I will say for, for my purposes, largely Cisco Secure Endpoint is, is what we use for our threat hunting activities to identify adversarial behaviors um, so that we can, again, stop them where they are, 
uh, try and determine what they're trying to do, what their objective ultimately is, and evict them from the environment before they're able to, of course, uh, achieve their goals. Um, <clears throat> a, a really big piece of this also, and Nick and I were just talking about this outside, I think, is, is even more than technology, but it also comes down to uh, a human training thing. Mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing, not just in Ukraine right now, but we're seeing substantial efforts uh, by both kind of lower sophistication and higher sophistication adversaries to target individuals with social engineering techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not going to go away, right? The, the human element at this point, as far as I'm concerned, is still the weakest element. Yeah, and it's interesting because we were just at RSA last week, and Mitch, we miss you, um, but Mitch and I were talking about um, the importance of lived experience, right, to assess these risks and to have a diverse perspective on your team to be able to um, continue to mitigate whatever risks we are, so that's incredible. Do you mind getting a little deeper? and talking about some of the specifics around um, the threat hunting activities that we're implementing on the team. Yeah, um, we're, <laughs> we're taking some, ins what, are, what are inside of our organization anyway, relatively unprecedented steps. Uh, at the onset of the invasion of Russia into Ukraine, we formed a specific task unit uh, comprised of volunteers all across Talos um, and many across Cisco as well. Uh, that I'll touch on more briefly here in a second, um, but we've effectively formed a security operations center or a SOC for uh, all of the different Ukraine organizations that opted in uh, and asked us for help. Uh, in these organizations, we've deployed all of the tooling that I've talked about. We are actively monitoring all of that tooling over a 24-7, or 24 uh, and you know I've got all level of analysts that are flagging things for reviews. There's at this point, probably not a five-hour window that, that goes by without some type of notification from the team uh, of an event or a behavior or an observation that, uh, that they flag for further review by another senior analyst. Um, so we're, we're aggressively working with these organizations. We're helping them to be very aggressive in their hunting and their understanding of the adversary. Uh, and we're finding a lot of... Um, I, I, it's kind of inappropriate to say cool new things. To, the, to us, that's what they are. They're still really evil things, yeah. unfortunately. Still really cool, though. It, it, yeah, right. it's like sci-fi <laughs> in real life. Yeah, it's awesome. But not awesome, right, obviously. Um, so, Dave, for you, what, what would a local approach look like for enterprise defense then? And please, anybody feel free to chime in. Let's make this a dialogue. A local approach? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm of the assumption that means if they were cut off in, in many ways. Is, is that the best way to put that? I'm gonna make the assumption that this is what okay. the script wants, yes. Well, Sing <laughs> Sing Singapore is a fantastic <laughs> case study there. For years they've been uh, structuring their country in a way that in the event they had to, they could actually cut off the entire country from the rest of the planet and still operate safely and securely. And that they are definitely one of the front runners to be sure. But this is a thing that we really have to look at now as a possibility where you know Canada or US or some, whoever might ultimately have to cut themselves off from the rest of the world depending on the threat landscape uh, that is presented to them. Um, I don't think that many countries are anywhere near that capacity at this point, but uh, hopefully that will be a, an ability that countries can build up over time. And to, by extension of that, for enterprises to be able to operate you know, in the event that there was a critical failure that's the one interesting thing about organizations today is, you know, we always used to hear the idea of, you know, our systems are five nines, we're good. But that just meant you had accepted that there could be an outage and you're willing to run with that. Technology is such today that we don't need to have five nines, that we can have that 100% uptime if it's architected properly. And making sure that you have the trusted partners, you have the tools, and very much to build on what JJ was saying, having that human element developed in-house uh, is really key because a lot of organizations, they may you know, go looking, trying to hire people externally when they may have those resources internal to their own organization. They just need to be mentored accordingly to build them up. So you know, looking at your assets and your environment in a different way is really a good way to help build those things out, especially when you have to consider the possibility that one day you may actually be cut off from the rest of the planet for a period of time. 
Uh, and this is not fear, uncertainty, and doubt. This is just a practical reality of where we live because the internet ha doesn't do borders. Yeah. Um, and we have to make sure that we're planning accordingly so that we can be resilient. Yeah, and, and if you look at some of the lessons that enterprises can learn from this, um, one of the things that we've seen is as an enterprise, you need to have the ability to, say, increase the amount of monitoring you're doing from traffic out of a certain country, or potentially even saying, I need to cut off all of my traffic from a particular country. Those are things that we didn't really have in our threat playbook and the things that we would do before this type of event happened. And now a lot of organizations are needing to figure out ways to do just that. So what do you think some of those primary obstacles that exist that defenders are challenged by? And I'd like to hear from all of you, because I think every one of you might have a different perspective. There's lots of things that <laughs> challenge people, Just unfortunately. give me one, though. Um, probably one of the biggest ones is assets. People do okay. not have a firm grasp of what their assets are, where they're located, who owns them. Uh, it makes it very difficult to defend if you don't know what you're defending or what is running on the systems that you're defending. And, and, and even a categorical understanding of those assets, right? So. Um, one, if you don't understand where all of your assets are, you're probably not going to understand necessarily where the, the jewels are at, right? Where, where is exactly. the, the prime target that the bad guy is going to look at? And, and we've seen cases also where the, the organization may not even understand what their prime target is, right? They think it's this asset over here when in reality it's a simple bug system that the bad guy is looking for. They want to get into the bug system so they can develop exploits against the source code for that organization, for example. Um, but I think, t to me, um, it, it comes down to, again, kind of the human bit, right? More training. We've seen time and time again in a number of organizations where they have relatively well-trained personnel. They've got lots of tooling in some cases. Um, but either they're not paying attention to certain things and they don't see these early warning indicators that may be happening, um, or they don't understand what the early warning indicators might be. Um, and, and that's a challenge because those early warning indicators certainly can change from week to week or day to day in some cases. Uh, so, you know, it's, a, it's certainly a challenge. And, and, and right now a big challenge that uh, a lot of organizations are facing as well is um, is burnout, right? Mm -hmm. We've been running hot on this thing for at least two months prior to the invasion. Uh, so, you know, we're cycling people in and out at an aggressive rate inside of this task unit that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and we're getting a good, a good handle on that, but you also always have those individuals that um, don't seem to want to sleep or stop and you have to force them to, so. <laughs> Having burned out twice in my career, I can say it's highly overrated and don't do it. <laughs> Uh, only twice? Only twice, wow. as, which is actually kind of low. It's amazing. Um, and the other thing, too, that organizations have to take into account is to build on what JJ was saying uh, is actually security debt. And what I mean by that is, you know, a, a deprecated asset is operating within your environment that has not been updated for a period of months or years, but has now introduced a security problem into the environment, either by virtue of the, you know, a vulnerability being discovered or interaction with other systems. And a lot of times we'll see that in organizations I worked at over the years, a project would be rolled out and there was never sunset provision built into that project plan. So this, these projects would limp on, you know, five, 10 years past their acceptable lifetime and they were not being managed properly or patched. And it was really interesting. We, we had a report that we put out last year, uh, the security outcome study that looked at a lot of organizations. This was a double blind study that was done. It was rather fantastic. And it talked to about 5,000 organizations, and they found that a lot of them, where they got their biggest value add was doing a forklift upgrade in a lot of cases, as well as having clear uh, understanding as to what the threat data was in order to reduce the risk in their organizations. So that was actually quite nice. Yeah, it sounds like from all three of you a little bit, it's going back to basics, right? It doesn't always have to be the sexy new tool. It doesn't have to be product related. It's as simple as knowing your assets, right? And compliance and understanding your threat landscape a little bit. So um, I'm sure that that is, well, we all know that that's different given enterprise or small organizations, what ha nation states even. Um, I know that the White House and CISA have provided warnings that there's obviously an increased likelihood of cyber attacks against Western companies and infrastructure from, you know, we were gonna say Russia <laughs> and Russian sympathizers um, in response to a lot of the global sanctions. So how should enterprises interpret this warning? But also like how should people 
interpret this warning in general? So the first thing is don't take it as something is imminently gonna happen right now. That's mm -hmm. not what they're saying. Um, what they're saying is if you look at the possible scenarios for where we are today and where this is going, the likelihood that there is gonna be some sort of cyber component coming out of this is higher than it's ever been. So do the things that they have been telling you for the last 10 years, do them. Now is the time to make sure you have done them and that they're in place. We talked about the basics. The basics are what you have to lean on in an incident. If you are in the middle of an incident and you don't have the basics, you are gonna have a very, very hard time. CIA, baby. Confidentiality, <laughs> integrity, and availability, That's right? right? That's what it is, That's back right. to the basics. Anybody else? I think, I think Nick really hit it on the head, right? The, the messages that have been coming out, the tempo at which they've been pushing them mm. um, from the Bureau, I think NSA has published stuff, obviously the White House has published things and, and CISA. Uh, I think it speaks to the fact that they're all very concerned, right? And I think a key thing to, to note here also that we've observed um, during this war is frankly something that I didn't fully expect, or at least not at the scale that it has occurred. And that's the, the sympathizers for all sides jumping into the fray. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy right now, the lines and how they're blurred from nation state and cyber criminal actor um, in, in the different cases that we're tracking and the different threat actors that we're keeping an eye on. Um, we're, we're seeing threat actors doing both, right? We're seeing them conduct nation state level actions and we're seeing them also conduct your general cyber crime level actions uh, on the same infrastructure, um, against the same targets. It's, it's a really crazy time on the internet. And I think that certainly helps elevate the threat, right? It's not just the nation state guys. It's um, the, the group formerly known as Conti guys kind of thing, right? Um, it's, it's other ancillary uh, actors that are acting on behalf or friends to those, those different nation states. It's even IT Army of Ukraine, right, came out and said, hey, if you wanna support us, go DDoS Russia. Here's a bunch of tools, just run the tool, it's gonna attack Russia for us. Um, certainly the same things are occurring inside of Russia, make no mistake. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the wild, wild west uh, out there and, and it's a valid concern to have. Obviously that's why they've raised it and flagged it so many times. Right. Dave, do you have anything to add? Oh, no, I mean, it, it's not just a US-centric thing. I mean, uh, countries around the world, like in Canada, where I'm from, we've been posting alerts as well. So it, it is something that is very much in the front of mind for countries around the world. Even ones that are even tangentially associated with the war, um, they are definitely seeing a spillover effect. And uh, it basically, by virtue of the fact that you have an IP attached to the internet, you're a target. Yeah, for sure. Um, so what are some of those key actions? I know throughout the conversation you all have touched on a few of them already, but if we can summarize from each of you a few key actions um, that must be taken immediately to prepare and apprise in critical infrastructure for this increased volume of attacks, what kind of recommendations would you give? Mine goes back to that, be aggressive. Secure your environment for you. Don't, don't just leave the protections that are available out of the box. Realize that you can be far more aggressive. Block stuff that you don't need to access. You don't use four or five collaboration apps, block them and make them not available on your network. These are the actions that you really need to take. Just be more aggressive in what you do. I think, uh, again, I'm gonna continue with my mantra of agreeing with Nick. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a good place to be. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I agree, be, be aggressive, but I would add into that, be aggressive in following up with the basics. Everything that has been preached, uh, or has been preached, excuse me, for, for years now, um, MFA makes a big difference, it does. Um, making sure that you have visibility, right? Whatever that means, making sure you have that visibility, whether it's increasing logging, because you can't afford an EDR, whether it's buying an EDR and putting it on all the things, make sure that you have some level of visibility. That may not stop the bad guys, but it's at least going to give insight into what the bad guys did when they got there or what they're doing while they're there. And ideally, uh, that will allow you to contain them and, and ideally evict them more quickly. Um, and, and train your people, right? Even um, basic training about 
you know, IT is never going to call you and ask you for your password, so don't give it to them, right? Uh, if they call you and ask you, it's not IT uh, kind of thing. I think that's good enough for me. It was kind of... <laughs> That was good, that was great. <laughs> so knowledge has to become capability is the real key piece of the puzzle here with you know, threat intelligence, having third party providers that you can lean on as a trusted advisor, uh, being able to ha know when you need to ask for help as an organization mm -hmm. because nobody can do this alone and we all have to you know, pull together. Again, looking at your organization from a security debt perspective, making sure that you have a clear understanding as to what it is that you're trying to protect in your networks and your systems. And a part of that can be having a clear strategy. You know, people like to say zero trust is an example. That is fundamentally about reducing risk in your environment. And then the last part of that is making sure you build up your people, very much what you know, these guys were talking about. If you're building up your people and you are building up that knowledge base, sure, they might leave to go to another company at some point. But again, you're raising all boats fundamentally in the long term. So you want to make sure that you're investing in your people and making sure that they are having the ability to contribute and being felt like they are empowered to do so. Mm. And oh, be honest with yourself. You know, you have to do self-assessment on where you are as an organization. You don't do yourself any favors by portraying yourself as being more mature or more sophisticated than you are. Be honest with your own assessments. It'll help you a lot in the long run. I love this. I feel like we should use this advice for everything. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, some of the key takeaways, because I see I think we're going to go into questions into the audience. But um, a few of the lessons learned from what I'm hearing, the conversations that we've been having all around, is that this is impactful, what's happening in Ukraine. But it's also something that isn't much different than what the cybersecurity industry has been experiencing at just in general, right? This is just putting emphasis on something that we've all known. And you don't have to do anything crazy. You have to stick to the basics. You have to be human through the process, right? Remembering um, about burnout, taking care of your team, translating things into simple language so that people are aware outside of the scope of your security team. And um, going back to all of the basics. So um, thank you all so much today for answering all of these questions.